Hey, thanks, Valerie. And welcome back to the many familiar faces in the chat. Great to have everybody here. And as Valerie mentioned, while this is the third session in a three-part ringworm series, I want to point out that we've added a 90-minute ringworm Q&A session tomorrow at 5 o'clock Eastern Time. This session will focus only on ringworm, and there's still time for you to register and pose your questions in advance. But today, we've still got a lot of ground to cover. And for those of you just tuning in, Dr. Sandra Newberry is with the UC Davis Shelter Medicine Program and focuses much of her work on infectious disease, immunology, and population medicine to improve understanding of shelter animal health. We have been incredibly fortunate to have Dr. Newberry as our ringworm guide, so I'll turn the rest of the session over to her. Hi, everybody. I um, hope you're having a good afternoon, and I'm really excited. This is what we're going to do today is go through a couple of case studies of what, um, animal, what animal shelters are actually doing and how they're setting up the programs. So for some of you who have been here um, for all the presentations, some of this will be a little bit of a review, but I think that will be okay and good for you to sort of have everything come together um, and put in context, and so that's, that's what I try to do. So the first picture that you're seeing here is one of my favorite sites to see. Um, this is something Beth Rogers, who is the coordinator for the Ringworm Program at the Dane County Humane Society, she coordinates all the volunteers. Um, takes these pictures of the kitties as they're leaving um, the ringworm treatment center, and she has these. I should have showed you all of them. They're covering the walls, and so we can see everybody who's graduated from that program. We're going to learn about that program a little bit today. I am watching the chat, so if you have questions as we're going, please let me know, and I'll try to pick those up. I'm going to probably ask you a couple questions in the chat as well. Um, so the two case studies that we're going to look at here today are the Dane County Humane Society in Madison, Wisconsin, and the San Francisco SPCA um, in San Francisco, California. And we're going to kind of compare and contrast. The, one of the reasons that I chose both of these two is that they're really following the same model. So you'll see there's some differences, but in many cases they're following the same model, which makes us really happy. I wanted to start out, this is, I asked Dr. Scarlett, who's the co-president at San Francisco SPCA, to tell me what she, how she felt about having their ringworm program there, and this is what she said, is taking on ringworm with a logical screening, diagnostic, and treatment program, rather than just spreading about it, is well worth the effort. Not only does it save a lot of lives through screening and treatment, it can be a great way to develop and give confidence to your medical and adoption staff. We respect ringworm and the damage it can do to an adoption program, but we know how to handle it. So for us, it only enhances our life-saving efforts. Thanks, ringworm. And I think there's something really great about that way of looking at it, and it is, as I often say, one of the few treatable, curable diseases that we encounter in shelters. Um, so it is something, you know, kind of fantastic that we can put these programs in place um, and know that we can get the animals through. Okay, so then the next uh, sort of quote that I asked for was from the director of the Dane County Humane Society, just so you could kind of see before we get into the details of the programs, how people feel about them. And this is from Pam McLeod Smith. She's the director at the Dane County Humane Society. The Dane County Humane Society is proud and grateful to participate in operating high-quality standards of care, life-saving ringworm treatment program for cats, along with the compassion and expertise given by UC Davis and UW Veterinary School of Medicine. This partnership has truly impacted our shelter operations and has been an inspiration to staff, volunteers, and our community, and our donors. We look forward to continuing to grow the program in the future to help save even more cats. And so, as you'll see, as I'm going to go through these two programs, the Dane County Humane Society was really the first program of its kind. Um, we started it in 2003. It was initiated by really an amazing group of volunteers who wanted to change what was happening. The shelter had had a recognize and euthanize policy, and um, even Pam, the director of the shelter, recognized that that policy really failed to control disease problems, 
And when we look at it retrospectively, what we see was that the huge difference was in reporting, that there was very, I hate the word compliance, but there's really no better word to use in this case, that there was really very little reporting of the problem. And what we see is that as soon as the the option is euthanasia, people get much worse at finding ringworm lesions. And so what was happening was a lot of ringworm lesions were sneaking by. There were lots of frustrated volunteers who were um, who were sort of sneaking off with ringworm uh, infected kittens into foster care without letting anybody know that they had lesions and that was infecting foster homes and there was really an enormous problem. This amazing group of volunteers who really wanted to change things um, came up with this idea that they were going to um, take Sally's uh, sister's trailer, um, which you'll see in a little bit. Her sister was moving from one trailer into another trailer and, and said that they could have the old trailer, and they were going to take it and they were going to set it up as a place where um, cats could just go to self-cure because they had heard that they the cats would self-cure. I came into the shelter right around the same time that everybody was coming up with this idea, and I said, hey, that's a great idea, but let's approach it a different way. Let's really make it a clinical treatment area. Um, and so that's what we did. I enlisted the help of Dr. Karen Moriello, who is a board-certified dermatologist who had really focused her entire life on um, rainworm, but had really never been involved with animal shelters. So it was really amazing um, that she was willing to come in and help. And because I had had all the experience with animal shelters, she had the experience with ringworm. And we had this dedicated group of volunteers. That was really what made it happen. San Francisco SPCA started their program um, a few years ago, and actually, I know we have a representative here. I'm not actually positive what year their program started, but it, they started really modeling the program from Dane County Humane Society and what has become kind of the recommendations that we make from UC Davis. Um, and for the San Francisco SPCA, the program really uses staff veterinarians and staff technicians. They're hoping to have more volunteers involved in that program um, as, the, as, as time goes on. Program supervision, I'm going to kind of go through one for one program and one for the other. Program supervision for Dane County Humane Society, um, the sort of big picture overview for that program comes from the University of California Crop Shelter Medicine program, primarily me. Um, and the University of Wisconsin, primarily Karen Morello, and we're still pretty involved with that program, and we're always um, kind of looking into what's going on with that program, and we actually tend to use that program as the site for our um, field research as well when we want to sort of ask a new question. Um, we'll often do it through the Dane County Humane Society program. There's a clinic manager who runs all of the medical services, and then there's a program supervisor who, pro who one of the programs she supervises is the ringworm program, and then there's a program coordinator who has 10 hours a week to try to pull together all the volunteers who run that program, but it's important to recognize um, that that is really a volunteer program, and if it wasn't a volunteer um, muscled program, there probably wouldn't be any program at all. And that was actually one of the things that um, went into the program starting out very early on is there just wasn't money to staff the program. And when the volunteers said they wanted to do it, we, kind of, we said to them, you know, we want to do this too. If you can provide the manpower, the staffing power, then we can make it happen. And they really understood that the work that they, was, that they were doing was life-saving work and that without them, it wouldn't happen. And so that's always been something that's very important to them. And for any of you who've heard me talk about ringworm, I almost always thank them because, or I try to always thank them, <laughs> um, because I feel like they gave me the opportunity to learn so much. And the work that they did here in Wisconsin has been work that we've been able to spread all over the place, um, hopefully not too much like ringworm. <laughs> 
Program supervision for the San Francisco SPCA um, is pretty similar in many ways. There are staff veterinarians who oversee the medical aspect of the program. And the reason that I have that in bold on this slide is that I have seen some programs where there really isn't too much veterinary involvement in terms of setting up the protocols. And I want to caution you um, to be careful about that. So you really want to make sure that you have veterinary involvement um, so that, you know, what you really are doing here is diagnosing and treating an infectious disease that humans can catch. So we want to make sure we have veterinarians involved. In the case of San Francisco SPCA, they actually also have a shelter director, the president of the San Francisco SPCA, the co-president, who's also a veterinarian. Um, there's a foster associate, um, and we I think of her as kind of the ringworm program coordinator, and you can see how somebody who was interested in working on foster care could end up caring a lot about ringworm as well. And she's here if she wants to say hi in the chat. Um, and then they get some advice, advice on setup and some advice on program supervision from UC Davis. For Dane County Humane Society, the staffing, as I said, is really all volunteer. They have uh, two staff veterinarians, though, who look at fungal cultures every week and who look at their new cases. Um, but the cases and everything is set by, um, by the protocols that are put in place. Um, the incredible volunteers do culture reading, they do daily treatment, they do all the cleaning and feeding for the animals in the treatment center, and they do all the dipping. Um, there's Laura. Laura just said hello from San Francisco SPCA. Um, treatment cultures um, are all done at University of Wisconsin, and that's partly because of the research and trust that Dr. Moriel has in that, but you could do that yourself. Um, program staffing for the San Francisco SPCA is primarily paid staff. They have staff veterinarians, technician staff, um, and animal care who do the culture reading, the daily treatment, cleaning and feeding, and the topical treatments as well. So I want to talk about flow through a little bit, and this is a really complicated slide, but I, I have, I've experimented with different ways of doing this, and uh, this, I'm hoping this will help everybody kind of understand. So if we start with an intake exam and a check for lesions, and the first animal that we look at has, has lesions, so that's what this little positive sign is for. And the wood lamp exam is also positive. We would then do a direct exam or a microscopic exam of the hair. And if any of you were looking earlier, Mary put in how she had diagnosed ringworm in a kitty, and she had done exactly um, all of these steps, so I gave her a gold star in the chat. <laughs> and then if we do that, what we're going to say is, wow, it's, wood, it's got lesions, it's woods positive, direct exam of hair, that animal's going to get treated as truly infected at the Dane County Humane Society. Um, they will also set up a fungal culture growth. They'll microscopically identify that. Now, in almost every case, if not every case, that's going to just confirm what they saw with the woods lamp and the direct exam of hair, and I'm not actually aware of them ever having that go in a different direction. So another alternative is you could do an intake exam, have a positive check for lesion, so you found a lesion, but your woods lamp exam is negative. Now these ones below are going to start getting a little bit more complicated. This is in some ways, even though we're not hoping that animals are um, infected with ringworm when they come to us, this is the simplest, most clear path. So if the woods lamp exam is negative, then you need to take a fungal culture. And once you take the fungal culture, you need to wait. And for us, in our hands, and I'm going to talk to you just about how they do their cultures. We've got a whole little section on culture management. Um, these animals have to wait five to ten days for the culture results to come in. Now, Emma has a great question, which is, and where do the cats wait? Where are they while they're waiting? In different shelters, they have different places, and we just had a meeting about this at Dane County Humane Society that we don't really like the spot where they have to wait right now. But at Dane County, they actually have a seven-day stray holding period, so they have to hold them most of this time anyway. And when we get to talking about 
um, fungal culture management, you'll see how it is that we can start to have an idea of whether this lesion that we saw is really a ringworm infection or not. Emma has another question in there, why not just treat them like they were infected? Because you'd be treating way more animals than you need to probably. Because not every animal with a lesion is going to actually be infected. And in fact, the majority of animals who have some kind of lesion that is woods negative will probably not have ringworm. So that's something that's important to recognize. In San Francisco, we'll come back to this, but in San Francisco, they actually have a place that's just set aside for ringworm observation. Okay, so if we wait and they're fungal culture positive with a microscopic ID, then we treat them as, they're, as though they're truly infected. The question is, you know, so then you missed a week of dipping and exposing the other animals in the holding room. That's why we only do this for animals who are woods positive. These are great questions, by the way. Why we only do it for animals who are lesion positive but woods lamp negative. So remember, the reason that we're doing it this way is that we're assuming that these animals are most likely negative and we're just sort of trying to clear them. If what you find out is that most of the animals that you have that have lesions and are woods negative turn out to be truly infected, you may want to put something in place, you know, where you would start treatment on them. But treatment can be in fact, uh, expensive. And so, and what I'm trying to show you is how this particular program works. So in this program, they don't do that and they haven't found it to be necessarily necessary. And the normal outcome for this pathway is actually the opposite of what I showed you first. So maybe I should put this slide together a different way. The normal pathway is that these animals are fungal culture negative and they're released for adoption. So this is the common pathway is that these animals are fungal culture negative and they're released for adoption. Um, so, uh, so there you go. And Mary's asking, can you quarantine the positives with the woods lamp negatives? You could. Um, you absolutely could. You just need to be careful that you're not cross-contaminating. So you need to put things in place where, um, where, uh, you know, you could prevent animals from being exposed to ringworm because, again, as I said, most of these animals are going to turn out to be fungal culture negative in most shelters. Okay, the third option at Dane County Humane Society is for this intake exam, the check for lesions, the animal is negative, woods lamp exam, the animal is negative. So be sure to realize that they're checking everyone for lesions and they're also checking everyone with the woods lamp, every animal that comes in, every cat that comes in. In this case, if the animal has no lesions and it's woods lamp negative, there's no way. That animal is just moved up for adoption. Now, in lots of shelters, that's all that would happen. At Dane County, and this is partly because they went through this long period having really major problems with ringworm, um, before we started this program, they fungal culture every single animal that comes in the door, and then they, they get those results in five to ten days. I want to be clear, they're not waiting for those results before that animal is released for adoption. So in many cases, animals are adopted before they get these fungal culture results back. This gives them a sense of comfort in, their, in that if for some reason something snuck through on them, they would be able to pick it up and they could call the adopter, have the adopter bring the animal back, and they would be able to treat or they would be able to screen the animal and see what's going on. Um, so that's, all, that's the way Dane County is doing this. Remember, Dane County was the first program of its kind, and at the time that we started the Dane County program, we really didn't know that much about the way that um, ringworm behaved in shelters. Dr. Moriello, as I said, had spent a lot of time looking at ringworm in privately owned animals and other places, but we hadn't spent a lot of time with ringworm in shelters. And so when we initially started the program, we started this culturing of everyone at intake because we really didn't, we thought maybe that's really what you needed to do in order to never have a case slip by you. 
since then, we've become much more comfortable with this screening process that I'm talking about, this check for lesions and a Woods lamp exam. And I see there's a question about, well, how do you really know if the lesion looks like ringworm? And I'm going to send you back to the first webinar, which we called Ringworm 101, because what I've got is a bunch of pictures in there and an explanation of, you know, what makes things look like ringworm. It's looking for those inflammatory lesions and then looking for the Woods positive uh, glow when you're using the Woods lamp. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is the San Francisco SPCA program, Flosterin. I hope you're recognizing that this slide did not change very much. So they're pretty much using the exact same protocol. The main difference is in this last flow through plane here, this last blah, sorry, flow through pattern, they're not culturing animals. If they check them for lesions and their woods exam negative, they're not feeling the need to culture them. And so they don't get those fungal results in five to 10 days. They're just releasing those animals for adoption. And that is the recommendation that we make to most shelters at this point because of the cost of culturing every animal. Um, depending on the level of comfort you feel like you need or depending on kind of the bad experiences that you've had or what the expectations are for adopters in your community, you may decide that you want to do more fungal cultures. Um, they're doing fungal cultures um, on any animal who's either got a lesion and is either woods positive or woods negative. It's SFSPCA. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions about this initial sort of intake um, flow through? Just looking to see if I got everything. Okay. All right, so this is only, and I see one question about um, resolved lesions. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about just animals as they're coming in the door. So then for Dane County Humane Society, who's culturing even the non-lesional animals, we have a system that we use for them where we say if the animal has one to nine colony forming units, so you can see here there's three, and let me see if I can grab that pointer. So here's one, here's another, and here's another. So there's three colonies growing on this plate. And we would say if this animal had no lesions, we would just treat that animal as a fomite carrier. If the animal had lesions, then we would automatically treat that animal as truly infected. So if the animal is considered a fomite carrier, what we're doing at Dane County right now is something they call the dip and go. And again, the dip and go came from when we started this program, we didn't quite know what would become of these animals who had no lesions, but they had a few spores that had hit their plate. And um, what we found was we actually wanted to do a little bit of a study where the animals would come in, they would get a fungal culture taken, we'd get this back in about a week, and if that was positive, we would go to the animal and we would wipe the animal down, reculture them, and send them on their way and see um, whether that was enough and the animal didn't need treatment. Well, what actually happened was we went back to the animals five to seven days later, we would culture them, and none of them were ever still positive. And so either we were removing the spores with the toothbrushes or the animals were removing the spores and grooming. And so what we found was that it could be, again, as a level of comfort, that no action is just fine for these animals with low spore counts and absolutely no lesions. It's always good when you get the culture results back, because remember, there's always a time lapse here when we're talking about fungal cultures. There's usually between five and 10 days from the time you take the culture till the time you get the results. So it's always good to go back to the cat and look at the cat and make sure that no lesions were missed. But if you have culture results for an animal and they still have no lesions and there's fewer than nine colony forming units in general, 
we can um, take that animal and just move them on their way. Um, if, a, if just a, a single lime sulfur dip makes you feel more comfortable, that seems to be good enough too. Okay. And Sandra, there's a quick question in the chat, just checking that these protocols are the same for dogs and cats. Is that a good assumption? Yes, they're the same for dogs and cats. The difference with dogs is there's a much, much lower index of suspicion for ringworm in dogs than there is for cats. And what I mean by that is that ringworm is significantly less common in dogs than it is in cats. And so it's great to screen dogs as they're coming into shelters. Um, I love to have people screening for lesions because I think when shelters are screening for lesions at intake, they actually just take more time to look more carefully at the animal overall. And so other problems are uncovered more easily as well. Um, but the other difference is that dogs will probably be woods positive, woods lamp positive less often than cats and infections in dogs again, tend to be less severe than they are in cats. What's more common in a dog um, with a skin lesion that might look like a ringworm lesion is something like a bacterial pyoderma is probably a lot more common than, um, than say, ringworm would be. And so, and, and as well as something like Demodex. So it's a lot more important to think about those other things in dogs than it is ringworm. And that's confusing, you know, because the main form of ringworm is called microsporum canis. So people, you know, tend to think, well, it must be really important in dogs, but it's, it's less important in dogs. Um, and yes, I would recommend using the same treatment protocol in dogs that we use in cats. Okay, I think I got all those questions. I'm just taking one second to look. Okay. All right. So, um, for both programs, bonded pairs and litter mates, non-lesional culture negative, what do we do? It's a judgment call. Um, you always have to sort of think about the risk, um, the risk of not enough socialization versus the benefits of lots of socialization, and then also what you expect the length of stay to be, that as you put more animals in a cage together, it often takes a little bit longer, probably not to actually get them cured, but probably more to um, get that cure defined. Um, what we often will recommend for um, non-lesional litter mates or bonded pairs is that the one who's non-lesional will just go on topical treatment and live with the other animal. And we've done that a lot of times and we've never seen any problem with it. The other animals never become ringworm infected. Um, you can, if you want to send them on their way, you can usually just do a dip and go and send them on their way to give you that extra sort of measure of safety. If it's uh, litters and some are lesional and some are not, you can subdivide those orphan litters by lesional status. Okay. When I say cure defined, what I'm talking about is the time, say we start treating an animal, if we take a culture the second week of treatment, it'll take three weeks for us to know whether the cat was actually negative at the time that we took that culture. And I'm, I'll come back to that in a minute. I'll show you on the slides. But so the time that cure actually happens, there's about a three-week lag from the time that cure happens till the time that we can confirm that cure happened. Okay. So intake, it's really important to get your intake area set up appropriately. And I've got all these questions listed here because this is what I see happening. And what happens is if your intake staff have to find all of these things, and it means they have to go looking all around to find it, um, they're not going to do um, all the things that you want them to do as they're screening. So it's really important to make sure all of these things are together. And I'll show you later in the presentation at Dane County Humane Society, it was almost impossible to get the intake technicians to use the woods lamp um, for a long time when we started the program. And then one day I went to watch and see why it wasn't happening. And I realized what it was was that the outlet was on the other side of the room and the only way they could get the woods lamp 
to their exam table was to stretch it all the way across the room, and then they had to turn on the lights, and then nobody could walk through the room. And so it, it was such a pain in the neck for them that they didn't do it, so we actually moved the outlet. So it's important to get set up so things are working easily for you. Reception means coming into the treatment area. And so what we're going to suggest and, and what both programs are doing is getting a culture before the animal goes in, dip the animal before entry. And this is really important because um, one of the things that we've done several times in the Dane County program is gone into the treatment area and taken fungal cultures. And what we find is there's very, very little contamination um, and lime sulfur is an amazing product for getting rid of fungal spores. And uh, if you dip them before they go in, then you're very likely to have, very unlikely, sorry, to have environmental contamination sort of confusing your treatment culture. So you can, it's much easier to get um, clean cultures that are really reflecting what's happening with just the animal. No clipping necessary. Uh, we have some questions that I got emailed about that, so I wanted to make sure that we said that the only time that we would recommend clipping is for something like a Persian um, who have particular issues with ringworm of their own or a truly, truly long-haired cat. And the reason that we recommend clipping in that case is their fur can end up really getting matted from all the dipping. Um, so in general, we don't like clipping, and that was something that we really discovered um, as we were as we were working. And yes, exactly, Peggy saying told us specifically not to clip because it distributes the spores and spreads them not only around that that particular animal, but it spreads them all over the environment. So you have to be extra careful if you are going to clip anything to make sure that you control the spread of the hair. So we're really not too fond of clipping. It's also incredibly important to um, keep your clippers cool. I've seen deep thermal burns come from cats uh, who have been clipped um, and who were sort of clipped in a hurry where they nobody stopped to let the clippers cool. And what you'll see in that case is like a week later, a deep thermal burn will come up from underneath the skin and the skin will just be dead. Um, and it's a terrible, terrible thing to see. So please, please be careful with that. Um, the last one in is the last one cleaned. So basically what we do at the Dane County Humane Society, and I'll show you this again, is they use numbers on the cages and whoever comes in um, becomes number 15 and whoever is just about to graduate is number one and the animals are sort of organized each week um, according to that. Two to three kittens per housing unit is true for both programs. The really nice thing about that is you can monitor the kittens better. And as I said, the more animals per housing unit, the harder it will be to define cure for the individuals. Um, because if one animal still has a couple of spores, they may be spreading them around to each other. So um, we really want to avoid, when we can, having a single kitten housed because we know we're going to house animals for at least a month when they're going into a ringworm treatment program. So what you try to do is, you know, balance the socialization with time to cure. So if there's two singles and they come in together, put them together as opposed to just leaving them on their own for a whole month without any um, company of their own kind. Um, obviously, it's always important to think about their other infectious disease concerns, and you, but you just have to balance things. And so it doesn't mean never, ever treat a single kitten. Um, sometimes you do, and if you do that, just know singles need more love. It's absolutely true. Um, identify their needs as they come into the shelter, into the treatment center, because, again, you know they're going to stay with you for about a month. I see somebody posting um, drug doses in the chat, and I would recommend that we don't do that um, because it really needs to be veterinarians who are giving you drug doses. The only thing I do want to comment on for this is that we don't find that compounded itraconazole works as well as um, standard itraconazole, the, the, uh, I'm sorry, the brand named itraconazole. So I will recommend to you strongly if you're going to use the itraconazole, 
we've been involved with a, a couple um, shelters that have started, more than a couple uh, shelters that have started programs and had really funny results with their itraconazole. And then as soon as they switched over to the brand name product, they were seeing really good results. So um, definitely look into that. Um, for fungal culture management, this is the incubator at the Dane County Humane Society. Um, we want you to use a really warm room or an incubator. Karen Moriello's lab is so warm that you have to wear like a t-shirt and nothing else. Um, and so she doesn't need an incubator, but in most shelters you do. I just wanted to show it to you. You know, we bought this incubator for 20 bucks, and all it needs to do is get to about 80 degrees. So there's lots of ways of coming up with incubators, um, and 78 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit is about what we're looking for. Um, what we do, this is again Dane County Humane Society, we put the cultures in bins by week. And I really wanted to show you guys this because a lot of people get really anxious and feel like it would just be impossible to manage all of these fungal cultures. But basically what happens is the intake staff, this shelf, it's hard to see right here, is labeled week one. And all the cultures for the week go in here. So starting on Monday, they fill this bin. And then this bin, the next Monday, will move down to week two. Now, some of those cultures have only been sitting in there for a day or two, but that's okay. And then a new empty bin goes here. Every single day, somebody will come through, pull out the bin, and look at each culture. Um, and we're going to do a little bit of a, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a quiz to see what we're looking for when we look at each culture. I see Karen has a question about where I purchased this incubator. It was a used incubator at the University of Wisconsin swap that some lab was getting rid of. And honestly, I think it's probably from the 1950s. Um, so try to look. Uh, one of the things I've heard is that fungal culture labs in hospitals tend to replace their incubators fairly regularly, or bacteriology labs as well, and that if you talk to them, a lot of them um, are willing to donate them because they get a tax write-off um, for when they're getting their new ones. So do a lot of checking. You don't need something um, fancy. Exactly, the principle is the same. All you need is to have something that will keep them warm. The biggest thing to look for is make sure it will go as low as 78 to 80 degrees because oftentimes they're more up around 90 to 100 degrees. So you want something really low. Um, and if you're paying lots of money for it, it's probably not what you want. <laughs> um, lots of people have also figured out ways of just making a closet really nice and warm. That's perfectly fine. It doesn't have to be an incubator. Like I said, in Morella's lab, we don't use an incubator. You just want to hit this 78 to 80 degrees. And the reason that you do, you can grow your fungal culture as cooler than that, but it gets really frustrating because they don't sporulate as well at cooler temperatures. So if you use this 78 to 80 degrees, you'll be able to see your positives come up faster. Um, make sure you have good record keeping in place. Use a paper notebook or an Excel sheet. I'm going to show you a little later what that looks like, or even use your shelter database. Um, we move the bins on the same day each week, and we do a quick visual exam of each culture every day until finalized. So let's hear you guys in the chat. What are you looking for when you do a quick vis visual exam of each culture? So I'm going to go through and I'm going to pick up each culture and look at it. And what am I looking for when I do that? What's my quick screening? So I could do that with these three bins, and it would take me less than five minutes. Great, you guys are excellent. Okay, so good job. Everybody knows what they're doing. So they're, so here's a really early fungal culture. This is really early growth, and I would pick this up. I would see red color change as my fungal colonies are growing, and I would see that they're white or almost colorless, and they have kind of this finger-like growth. So as I'm going through, what I'm thinking in my mind is either no growth, suspect, contaminant, heavy contaminant. I can't say anything more about it than suspect when I'm doing my quick visual check through the cultures. But this is something that I do every single day because if there's a lesional cat somewhere waiting in that waiting sort of period that we talked about, this culture is probably day four or day five. 
I can say, well, oh, I think that cat is suspect. And for some of you who are asking, that's a cat, you know, in a certain kind of situation, I might say, you know what, that cat's suspect, let's just start treatment, depending on my level of confidence. But there are sometimes cultures that grow like this that would then be negative. It's not too often. Okay, so in the chat, here's your quiz. Do I need to look at this culture under a microscope? And this is, for some of you who haven't been to all the webinars, you might not get the answer, but for some of you who have been. We have some good students here. I know. <laughs> and tell me why you think I need to, or why you don't, why I don't need to. It's kind of a trick question, but I'm hoping it'll be a good learning experience. Okay, Dr. Frankhauser wins. I didn't know he was here. So Dr. Frankhauser pointed out that right here we have green pigmentation in the middle of the colony. So great job, you guys, for all of you seeing, yes, it's red, and you know you always hear me saying you need to look at it under a microscope. You need to look at it under a microscope. So I'm glad, actually, that so many of you said yes. <laughs> but here's a little extra learning point, right, is that, we said pigmented colonies are never pathogenic. So that's the other happy rule about fungal cultures. If you see this green in the middle, even though it turned red, I don't need to look at it. And so this is one of the things that helps you get through your fungal cultures really, really quickly because you look and you're looking for red, 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 and I put those all in a pile. And then I look at everything that turned red and I look for pigment and I move my pigment out. And so the only ones I need to look for are non-pigmented colonies that have a red color change. Okay. It could be, but I think if you, once you get used to these, you'll see that this is actually the way the colony grows. But yes, it wouldn't be a bad thing. It wouldn't be wrong to take a minute and look at this, but because I see this growth in the middle. And remember also, Elisa, I'd be looking at this every day, so I'd be watching this colony grow. And when it started turning red, I would probably circle it. And so I would kind of get to know this colony as it was growing. And then once I saw this green color change, um, I would know I really didn't need to bother with it. Okay, so hopefully that didn't confuse you all too much. I thought it might be a nice learning point. Um, it was one that was in the culture bin actually yesterday. <laughs> so remember though, please, you do want to look at most colonies and especially while you're learning, it never hurts to look at more. It's always better to look at more than look at less. Um, it's often hard to tell. And what you really want to look for is canoes and rowboats. If you're looking for canoes and rowboats, you're going to be picking up most of the pathogenic fungi that you really need to know about. Again, managing a fungal culture lab, you really want to um, make sure that you have a high level of general cleanliness in the lab. We always put down paper towels on the work counter before we set a fungal culture on them. We clean the work surfaces regularly. We only open the cultures for a very short period of time, just long enough to get our sample, and then we close them dispose of all cultures as a biohazard. This is the DCHS lab. You want to have all your slides organized. This is all their um, positive or finalized cultures, and this is their log book um, where they log all of their results, and then they also log them into a spreadsheet as well. Hey, and Sandra, before you go on, I wondered if you wanted to pick up Elena's question, maybe a little urban legend there. Yes, and I was just about to, I just Perfect. saw it. So yes, that's absolutely wrong. The color change does not usually happen within 24 hours. Um, it can take uh, even up to a week to 10 days to see the color change, but usually um, it's much faster than that. If you think back to that one um, culture that I showed you, that color change came up probably in about four or five days. One thing that is definitely true is if the color changes long after the colony grew, then that's usually not a valid um, indicator because many, many fungi um, will change the color of the medium eventually. Um, so it's, you really want to see the color change as the colonies are growing. Okay. 
Um, so here is the beautiful pink trailer that used to be Sally's sister's trailer. Um, and it actually no longer exists, which makes me really sad. Um, but it was a fantastic place for us to get started. And one of the reasons I love to show it is to really have you see that, you know, all you need is a ward. Um, and in this case, here's the inside of it. And these cages were all for general treatment. And back here where you can only just kind of see there's a door. And back there, there were six more cages. Um, for cats who had ringworm and URI. So they had 15 cages, and we treated hundreds and hundreds of cats um, through that program. Um, you can see the red line here that was just duct tape that we put down on the floor to define this was our dirty area, and on this side of the duct tape was the clean area. Um, the kitties all got to look out the windows, and they had bird feeders and cat TV going on. Um, but you can see, pretty simple. and um, I think pretty doable. It doesn't need to be a separate building. It can be just a ward in your own shelter, and that's the way the San Francisco program is set up, that they can, um, you know, they just have these wards designated within their own facility, and as I'll talk about in just a minute, they even have flexible wards that they can use when they need to. So this is the treatment housing at the Dane County Humane Society, and this was put in place uh, in 2003. And I laugh now because I remember how hard I had to fight and argue um, to have big cages for the ringworm treatment program. And so this is what was considered big cages back then. And I kept saying, no, no, they're not big enough, which I'm sure you've all heard me do. <laughs> and um, now when I look at them, they seem kind of small. Um, and, uh, but they're bigger than the standard cages uh, were in the shelter at the time. So they are actually in the process of just getting ready to expand these cages, and they're probably going to do the porthole system and cut holes in them. But here you can see their tag numbers, and I saw somebody had a question saying, so are you constantly moving the numbers around? And yes, they're on little hooks, and they move them every week when they get the culture results, if they need to. So if this kitty is about to graduate, if he graduates, then somebody else will become number one for the week. He's only the number one kitten until he graduates. Um, they use these feral cat boxes to house the kittens while they're cleaning, um, and the kittens also love them. Um, they make excellent toys and perches as well. Um, this is the new Dane County Humane Society treatment facility that Maddie's Fund donated. And um, we're still kind of getting things set up the way, just the way we want them in there. And it's been a little bit of work. And it's really interesting to, to know that sometimes moving into a newer facility, a nicer facility, um, can actually end up being more work. It's much harder in some ways for the volunteers to work because it's so much bigger. Um, that they spend a lot more time walking, and so we're actually in the process of, of working out some new protocols for them. Um, but there are two still two dedicated wards within each treatment area, and I saw somebody had a question. When I say general treatment, that's for cats who have ringworm and no other infectious disease, and then the second ward is for cats who have ringworm and URI. It's just the way they always set it up. And there are the same number of housing units in this much bigger facility, and that may not stay that way forever, but the capacity of the program um, was defined by the number of volunteers and the volunteer hours there were to put in to care for the animals. Treatment housing at FSSPCA looks a little bit like this. So here's the, um, they have three, what we sort of think of as like single-sided dog runs, but this is more of a standard housing for San Francisco. And then they have these cages, which are actually really large. Um, stainless steel cages, and you can have a look what they look like inside. This is kind of inside the run. You can see those two kitties luxuriating. And then I love this lounger right here. <laughs> He's making the most of his large stainless steel cage. Um, so there's three dedicated wards within each treatment area. Each ward has stainless steel. Um, there's three single-sided dog runs. And so, again, they actually have about 15 housing units. We like to recommend protection for humans, and both the shelters as in our case study group are using either disposable gowns or washable gowns. Washable gowns save on landfill. 
here is uh, Dr. Carson, our second year resident, modeling the uh, washable gown, and Dr. Moriello over here um, with Ken, who I'll have to go back one step here, who was our first client in the Dane County Humane Society Ringworm Program. Um, shoes, shoe covers are much better than um, foot baths, so we always like to recommend those, or either some other kind of dedicated, easy to remove shoes. Um, there we go, and then have your supplies organized. This is from San Francisco. Sanitation, we're working on looking at can we back off from some of the more vigorous kind of cleaning that's done often in the ringworm treatment areas. Um, and we're, so we're doing some research, just getting ready to start looking at spot cleaning for ringworm infected cats. And we think that um, it should work quite well. We're starting to use this cart because you can see how long this hallway is and the volunteers get really tired out walking back and forth for supplies. And we got these really nice carts donated that we'll be using as part of that study. Um, Sanitation is, you know, we really want to think about stress reduction, control, kicking up the dust. We want to have a high level, again, of general room cleaning. Mechanical removal of the spores is probably the most important thing. I see somebody talking about 1 to 10 bleach is a major pain, and we agree. And what we really want, we're just finishing up some research looking at the different disinfectants, and what we really think is that properly cleaning uh, in the end may actually even be more important than what disinfectant you use. And so clean, 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 and what Dr. Morello always says is what we really need is elbow grease, and it's really true. So laundry, uh, for the Dane County program, they have separate laundry because they're in that separate building. You can keep that laundry and wash it. Um, you want to bag the laundry as you're removing it from the cage. Launder it just after cleaning so it isn't sitting around and, as I say, sporulating, spreading spores all over the place. Don't overload the wash because, again, mechanical removal is what we're really thinking about in the washing machine. And use the dryer at high heat. We have actually done studies where we've put the laundry in, uh, cultured it before it went in and cultured it as it came out, and going through the washer and dryer seems to be adequate for getting rid of the fungal. Spores. Both programs are using the same treatment protocol where they're using twice weekly topical lime sulfur until graduation and 21 days of oral itraconazole as their systemic treatment. We really, if you haven't heard me talk about making a sandwich, yes, it is a marshmallow peanut butter sandwich, um, but we're really talking about a lime sulfur itraconazole sandwich. Um, if you haven't heard me talk about that, that's really what you want to be making is a lime sulfur itraconazole sandwich so you can get the kitties through and out of there. People ask all the time about post treatment with itraconazole. We find it to confuse shelter staff. It's not so confusing, but it's certainly less simple. And all the field research we've done, 21 days and stop was adequate. So that's really the recommendation that we make. Um, most likely, most of the cats have cured by three weeks. It's just that you need that additional time. Even if that wasn't the case, um, the itraconazole has residual activity and will remain. Wanted to just show you some examples of treatment sheets, and I can try to get some PDFs of these if you're interested, so Valerie can send those out. Um, but here's what they do is it's, if you look over here, it's just 21 days, and then as it says down here, stop, stop, stop. Um, and this is the same treatment sheet they use for everybody. It's a standardized protocol, so you can have standardized forms, and the consistency really helps everybody keep track of what they're doing. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly because we've talked about them already, but just to let you know, both programs are using the same system for applying topical treatment using garden sprayers. Dane County Humane Society, we loved having these portable dip sinks. Now the dip sinks are actually attached to the wall, but we still use these portable sinks because it's so much nicer to have them close to where the cats are in their cages and then be able to put the kitties right back in their cages, so I can't recommend these enough. They're really great and they're really cheap and anyone can install them. <laughs> Here's what the dipping looks like. Just wanted to include these to remind you guys. Um, here's the way we do monitoring. This is the way San Francisco does it. Here's their forms. Um, and then here's the way we do it when we're doing it from University of Wisconsin. We use these spreadsheets. And what I wanted you to be able to see is this is the week one culture for this kitty. It was 
a um, P3 because the number of colonies was too many to count. And you can see that this is only one week, uh, one week later culture after starting treatment. So the kitty, this culture got inoculated on the 19th and then this one was taken on the 23rd and it's already down to just three large colonies and the next cultures are negative. So they really do get better very quickly when they're on effective treatment. This is what graduation looks like, and I wanted to make sure to go through this with you guys. So if we think about the cultures cooking, that's what this is, week one, week two, and week three, because we want those cultures to sit for three weeks. We got an entry culture on this animal, and at week one, it was a P3 M. canis, so that means it was a pretty hot strain of M. canis and a real true infection. At, after the animal had one week of treatment, now it was only a P2 M. canis, but still that growth was happening in the first week. Here at treatment week two, in week one there was something growing, but we couldn't identify it yet, and that often happens as treatment goes on because you're poisoning the fungus, right? So it starts growing in really funny ways, and it becomes much harder to identify. At week two, we were able to identify M. canis, but it was only one to four colonies of M. canis compared to up here, which was probably too many to count. After that, you can see the treatment culture we took at week three had no growth for all three weeks. The culture we took a week later also had no growth. And what's important to see is that these two happen on the same day and that's the day we say to graduate the cat. So that's the day we confirm cure. One culture that was no growth for three weeks and another culture that was no growth for two weeks, that's when we define the animal as cured and can go on their way. Somebody had asked earlier about lesions. Sometimes the animals will still have hair loss, and if, especially if your treatment's effective, the hair doesn't have time to grow back that quickly. So you may still see hair loss. Um, the, the, when you see all the hair growing back, but the animal still culture negative, that's when you know that your treatment isn't working as effectively as, as it should, or when you have environmental contamination. Challenges. This is what both programs told me. So here's the outlets that I told you about, and here, here's the outlet that we moved to make it so that they could plug the woods lamp in and leave it on the table. And this was the difference between them using the woods lamp or not using the woods lamp. <laughs> so I really recommend um, looking at your layout. Challenges, resources, the time to get this done, the money to get it done. We know this is true. We know that this is, you know, I get so frustrated when I hear people sort of sniping at shelters and saying they don't treat for ringworm even though it's so easy. Well, it takes a lot of time and it takes some resources to get it done, and we all know that. It takes coordination, supervision, intake staff, exams is one of the things that I've heard so many programs talk about, that if you're, if you're not catching ringworm as it walks in the door, that's the difference between an outbreak or not. So really, if there's only one thing you can do in terms of managing ringworm in your shelter, set up intake exams. Uh, getting the training to everybody is really important and can sometimes be a challenge. Volunteer recruitment has been a challenge for, for both shelters. Seasonal capacity demands, um, you know, I was interested, I didn't get to hear so much of you from here, but October in Wisconsin is ringworm month. We always fill the, tra the, the treatment center during October. Um, the other big challenge, again, are the animals who just, I heard, I saw somebody say, you know, is it, um, you know, is it six weeks of treatment? It's at least a month of treatment. But, yes, for the cat I showed you the example of, that was six weeks. And so we know when we put an animal in for treatment, it's going to be at least a month because it takes that long to get the cure defined. The payoffs, they're huge, or sometimes they're small. Um, these are from San Francisco, SPCA, and, you know, this is why we do what we do. Um, <laughs> it's totally worth it. Um, for us, it, the paths have been amazing in terms of, you know, helping shelters, helping other shelters. This is a huge mission of both of the shelters that I'm highlighting today, um, building trust in the community, charting new territory, and educating veterinarians. Veterinarians used to understand ringworm in a much different way than they do since we've been doing this work. 
Um, the resources and expenses, I just laid it out kind of what the difference is here between Dane County and San Francisco SPCA. Um, the main difference for them is that San Francisco has more staff costs, um, but Dane County has to have supervision for their volunteers. I wanted to thank everybody from Dane County Humane Society and San Francisco SPCA who have done what they've done and also let me spend so much time kind of picking their brains about what they're doing and that they're so willing and open to share the information um, about what they're doing. I want to thank Dr. Moriella for caring about cat hair. She always says she's made a career out of cat hair. And um, I think, you know, the fortune, good fortune we all had to have let her, let me drag her into a shelter um, 10 years ago almost, so pretty exciting. And then I wanted to just thank to all of you for the work that you do. Um, it's really amazing. Your enthusiasm is our reward. And I don't know if anybody's here today from this shelter, but after the last session I got this email and was joking with Valerie and Susan that this is better than clicker training for veterinarians. They sent me an email and said, we've had a terrible year with ringworm in our shelter and in the community. We've participated in both of the recent ringworm webinars and were inspired to rent a trailer so we can start treating ringworm in our shelter. So um, that was about the happiest news I've ever heard. So I hope you guys will think about seeing if there's ways that you can treat for ringworm. I hope if you're treating for ringworm, um, it will, this will really help, um, help you sort of streamline your program. And if you have questions, you can um, let us know about those. We're happy to to answer those. We're working on a whole new website for ringworm that will be part of sheltermedicine.com and um, we'll let you know as soon as that that's done. So Dr. Newberry, thank you so much. This has been quite a journey and we're not done yet. There are some questions in the chat and I hope that many of you will um, meet back tomorrow at 5 o'clock Eastern Time. Bring your questions because we'll be talking fungus for 90 more minutes. So thanks, everybody, and hope to see you again next time. Thanks, Dr. Newberry. Thanks, everybody.